Hey guys, I'm Doyle Adams, pastor of the Elizabeth Baptist Church here in Benton, Louisiana. And I want to welcome you to another session of Real Talk, where we're dealing with racism and the church. Over the past couple of weeks, we've been having true, honest, open, frank conversation with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ to, to see how the church can deal with the sin of racism and lead our society in addressing this problem. I'm delighted to have with us a special guest, Brother Jeff Harper, a brother who I've met uh, via phone uh, about two or three weeks ago. We've had some very compelling conversation. So I, I want to invite him to come and share with us tonight uh, as we deal with real talk and, and, and get a good feel from the Word of God of how we as a church body, as fellow Christians, can deal with the sin of racism. So Jeff, if you don't mind, introduce yourself to our audience. Well, there's not much to introduce, Doyle. Um, I grew up, um, went to high school right in Shreveport, Louisiana. Went to Louisiana Tech University. Um, while at Louisiana Tech, though, I was introduced to Jesus Christ. Amen. I was in a fraternity. I was an officer in a fraternity. I was having a big life. And then I recognized that my life was not right. And God came into my life at that time. That is actually 43 years ago. Wow. And it has radically changed my life, and I'll never be the same. But I'm still, everybody should know that I'm just a, a guy that grew up in Shreveport, Louisiana, went to Louisiana Tech. And um, I am now a healthcare consultant. And the greatest opportunity that I have and privilege that I have is I get to work with guys in the disciple making business in Shreveport. Amen. And I've got um, the opportunity to work with both my, my dear white and black brothers and we work as mutual respect for one another and get to strive to build up one another and it's just been a blessing. Amen. Awesome. awesome. Well, uh, again, uh, I know that, and you were telling me earlier, I think previously uh, you had ran a bookstore in Ruston, Louisiana, a Christian bookstore, right? I owned a Christian bookstore in Ruston, Louisiana, and um, that was in the late 70s and early 80s. And I, um, it was a great, I loved the, the job, I, and I read a lot of books, as you can imagine. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, listen, I want, I want to uh, throw something at you. I was reading an article the other day, the Pew Research Center uh, did a study uh, and it says more than six in 10 black Christians say it's important for sermons to address topics like racial relations and immigration, according to re the, the study. Uh, then it says white, white Americans did not agree. More than six in 10 said those topics are not essential for pastors to address, with 40% insisting that race and immigration and other things like that should not be uh, mentioned at all in the church. So obviously there's a big varying difference there between the two races as to whether or not this issue should be addressed. I'll share something with you and I wanna get your input on this. I was invited to, uh, to go and share with a, a Bible study group. Uh, one of my neighbors uh, leads a Bible study group of men, about seven, eight men. Uh, most of them are between seven years of 70 and 80. And they wanted to just kind of share about the climate, the racial climate in America and what's happening uh, with, uh, with uh, the, the death of George Floyd and how, how that brought out uh, the protests and that type thing. And as we were sharing, I asked this question, because uh, I believe in asking questions to prompt people to think. I asked this very pointed question. I said, what do you think would happen if in the next three or four months, the church that you belong to uh, now became 50, 40 to 50 percent African-American? Uh, the guy next to, door to me, ne sitting next, next to me, uh, without any hesitation, said people would start to leave. So my question to you, Jeff, uh, if the church was growing, but it happened to be growing with more African-Americans coming in, why do you think that that guy said people would begin to leave? Well, first of all, they've been doing it all their lives. Okay. Every community in Shreveport is judged by how many, how pure, quote, pure it is. And once African-Americans move into that community, immediately people move out. And the church has either followed or led in that, I don't know. But um, Paul was real clear 
that the gospel was going to do something very, very unique. Racism is not something new in the 21st century here in Shreveport, Bossier, Louisiana. It's been an issue for years, and Paul declared in Galatians that there would no longer be that distinction. There would not be a Jew and a Gentile, male or female, that we would be one in Christ. And um, so from what I hear, I think in the pulpit you have to address race because we were given the ministry of reconciliation. And that ministry of reconciliation was to reconcile us to the universe, the world that we live in, to God, but to our fellow man. And um, the gospel is powerful enough to heal the wounds of racism. Amen. Amen. You said that, and I, I thought about one of the gentlemen who happened to be at this Bible study uh, said something that uh, it, was, it, was, it was somewhat profound, but it, it gets to the heart of what we're trying to do with these kind of conversations that we're having. Uh, and he said this as we were talking about the climate, racial climate in America and in our churches in particular. He says, Brother Doyle, I'm going to be honest with you. He says, when I was growing up, I was a racist. He said, I used the N-word quite often. Uh, he said, I treated blacks, uh, you know, uh, really bad. And he said, but something happened in 1993. He says, in 1993, uh, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and he transformed my heart. And from that point on, I have not looked at other races as if they were less than I was, or as, as if I was better than them. He, he said, Jesus Christ completely transformed my heart and my life and my way of thinking. And so that's what I'm believing and hoping that as we talk about these issues of race, that, that we look at it from a spiritual standpoint and allow the transformative power of the gospel to have its perfecting work in all of our lives, even to the point to where if someone is saved, but they're still holding a little prejudice in their heart, that the word of God will prick them in such a manner that it transforms the way they think about other people. And so I, 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 was, I was really glad to hear that because that's what I believe can help transform the lives of people. Well, I was, I didn't think I was racist. Every generation, it was, my, my dad was truly a racist, mm -hmm. but I thought I wasn't racist until my son told me that I was racist. And I didn't realize it, but I, but systemic racism is something that's all around us, but since it doesn't affect us, we don't focus on it. And once I focused on it and I realized that we got to do something. In 1954, the court struck down separate but equal. And for the first time, Brown and the Board of Education, it was clear that separate and equal, first of all, it was never true. Correct. It was never equal. <laughs> right. But at least at that point, we felt like that was a statement we could hold on to. But the courts were right. It was wrong. But unfortunately, the church has kept that policy that our churches should be separate. And it's, it reminds me of what happens. I'm in health care. The definition of cancer is when a cell acts abnormal. Cells in the body are supposed to somewhat minister to one another. Where there is need, you're supposed to go there. And you're supposed to take what nourishment you receive for that service. Mm -hmm. But cancer has a tendency to take what's given to us and not give it out to anybody else. Mm -hmm. And right now, if you look at the churches, even in the Shreveport, Bossier area, the areas that are in the most need, the churches have the less resources. Mm -hmm. And the areas where the churches have the most resources, we have the least need. Wow. That sounds like cancer. Right, right. And at some point, we need to wake up. We got people going all around the world to minister, and yet we have such dis difference between the black and white community right here at home. Mm -hmm. I have a good friend that's from India, Vijay Singh, and Vijay is a believer. He and I have a long-distance discipleship relationship between here and Hyderabad, India. 
Well, he comes to Shreveport one time and I invite him to church. He comes into church and he looks around and he goes, where are the African Americans? And I said, they have their own church. He goes, why? <laughs> and Doyle, I couldn't answer the question. Wow. How do you answer that question? Why? Mm. Wow. I, I, so that's, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I get carried away. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's very interesting. Because uh, Jeff, let me ask you this. Because you and I talk uh, uh, two or three times before I, I finally ask you the question, well, Jeff, what church do you go to? Because in our, in our conversation, it was free flowing and, and whether or not, you know, whatever denominational church you went to was irrelevant because we were talking about the scripture. We were talking about God and what we believe that God is doing in, in, in the racial climate in this country. Uh, so share a little bit about your background because it was interesting to me how you are strong in, uh, uh, in uh, pushing forward the truth of the gospel uh, and regardless of what church you belong to. Well, um, my wife can say it better than I can. She calls me a Baptist Methodarian, <laughs> which means that I have probably been a part of many congregations. Um, early on in my Christian life, I was trying to make Christians have more distinctives. Like, what do you believe? Do you believe this? Do you believe that? Do you believe this? And it had a tendency to try to pigeonhole every group. But I think in heaven, there's only one group in heaven. Amen. And even though we have racism that's rampant right here in Shreveport, Bossier, we have a type of racism when it comes to denominations. We're just as bad at separating one another. Wow. Oh, are, are, are they Baptist? Are, oh, they're Methodist? You know, that kind of mentality is not what Paul and Peter were trying to put on. No. And so, um, I, to me, um, every church here in Shreveport, Bossier, that acknowledge Jesus Christ as the Son of God, that there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, if they're worshiping the triune God, they're my brothers. Amen. And I need to pursue that. So um, I think I kind of fit in because <laughs> I, I probably, I've been dipped, dunked, fully submerged. In fact, my fingers are wrinkled with as many times as I've been baptized. Paul says there's, that you, there's only one baptism. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, many churches felt like I needed to be baptized again. I'm just now getting the wrinkles out of my fingers <laughs> from being baptized so many different ways. But, but God's people are everywhere and they're good people. And um, it doesn't matter to me if you can hold to those things, you're my brother. Amen. Amen. You, it's interesting you said that because I think part of, part of what we're trying to bring out through these conversations is, is God led, God ordained solutions to building relationships with people who don't look like us. Boy. And, and I think that you told me that you do a little Bible study group and you have a group that uh, you guys sit down and y'all break bread and y'all study the word of God together. Can you kind of give us some insight on that group and how it's working, how it got started? I don't quite know how it got started. Okay. Other than Jesus said, go and make disciples of all the nations. Teach him to observe all that I have said and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end. And so making disciples is a call and a commission that God's given us. And it's not just for me. You got it too. I mean, yeah. and it's, it's, it's for real. And so um, a few years ago, in fact, like 40 years ago, men invested their lives with me. They were like spiritual fathers to me. Yes. And they encouraged me. They told me what I needed to do to grow. They helped me with my wife. They told me to esteem her as I ought. They truly did what I'd call invest in me with the whole purpose that I would do likewise to someone else. Mm -hmm. And so... We now have about five groups in Shreveport 
that have done just that. We meet together. We tr strive to encourage one another. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking the assembly, which is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as we see the day draw near. Mm -hmm. Well, that's our goal is to build people up to the point where we're pressing them to go make disciples. I've got, there's one guy and, and all my guys know this guy. He was 80 years old and he was in our group. And I said, Mac, um, you need to make disciples. Now at 80 years old, he goes, well, I guess I do. I'll, I'll ask God how to do that. Well, that day he left and went to the grocery store after our study and he started a visit with someone and told them what he had just come from. And they said, well, I'd like to have something like that. And so the next week he started and now he has a group of men that are, it's too large for him. He needs to split it up again. Wow. And he's now 81 running hard and he's got men in his, in his study, both black and white. And he's learned so much from them that he really thinks he's going to finish the race well. And wow. I believe he is. And I'm, I, I'm getting to watch him finish the race well. <laughs> That's interesting. Now, your son has, a, I think you shared with me that, that your son um, uh, does something with African-American studies at Mercer. Is that, is that yes. correct? Yes. Tell me a little bit about that. Is he, I mean, because that's, that's, that's somewhat unusual when you look at the college landscape. Yes. Which... Yes. To, to be head of African-American studies at a university and you're a short white boy, it, it doesn't seem to kind of go along with that. Right. But my son developed um, an interest. He had some dear um, debate partners when he was on the debate team in school that were African-American. And he took two of them home to their house in Grambling at night, and the police pulled him over. Mm -hmm. It was profiling back then. It different than in what we talk about today. But he was pulled over because the, the policeman thought something was going on because why is a white young male in Grambling at this time of night? Mm -hmm. And it dawned on him that something that we've never talked about is going on. He noticed that half the town was living in an impoverished area with houses that many didn't even have electricity, while the other side was clearly marked that they had all the benefits of, of the municipality. And he, he wondered these things. And so in college, he started putting that together and recognizing what went wrong with Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. And he realized that nobody had taught Reconstruction the way it needed to be taught. And so that's what he majored in. He got his doctorate from UNC in emancipation through the Jim Crow era. And um, I would like to see that, say that I've taught my son a lot, but here of late, he's returned the favor. <laughs> and he has taught me that, yes, I was racist, and yes, there's things I need to know. And um, I've been very thankful for his, your son will teach you a lot, Doyle. Just wait, Amen. it's Amen. coming. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that, that, that's, that's, that's great because I think, uh, you know, to have a, a person with that knowledge base, a part of your family oh, yeah. who can drop those nuggets of wisdom uh, on you, uh, I think that's something that's, that's, that's real uh, it's precious and it's dear. And I, I, and, and, but I thought that was unusual, like you said, for him to, to, to major in that. Uh, well, his church recently asked him when the, when the George Floyd incident took place. His, he's, a, he's a member of a large Episcopal church in Macon. The church staff said, would you teach us how to respond to the injustice mm -hmm. that we see? And so he did a three-part study on that and he brought out some things that fortunately I got to hear some of it and some things that I didn't even recognize and I think 
if you live in the majority, which even though right now in Shreveport, the white is not the majority, yet it has got the majority of the funds and the majority of the real estate and the majority of the assets. So when I say majority, I'm saying not just number, I'm talking about dollars and cents. Right. Um, he brought something to light of the systemic problem. He says, Dad, can you imagine being born and based on what they find, meaning the color of your skin, one child is told that every time you buy a house and move from one house to the next house, that house will increase in value. And the next child that's, that's birthed, unwrap him and say, oh, but in your case, every time you buy a house, it will go down in value. And so I asked him, I said, what do you mean by that? He says, Dad, even most of the black areas of town are not financed by the bank. So that means the value of the homes go down because they can't get financing for it. And then if someone lives in that part of town and works hard and does everything they can to improve so that they might be able to buy on the other side of the tracks, he says, as soon as they buy into that neighborhood, guess what happens to the houses in that block? Mm. They go down in value. He says, so how would it be to know that when you're born, one guy's houses are automatically going to go up in value because of their color of their skin and one persons, all the houses they ever own will not increase in value. And knowing that houses are the major way that most people acquire wealth. Correct. And to think that that, well, I never thought of that. Mm-hmm. Being white, we have a tendency not to think about the systemic issues of racism. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so he's taught me a lot. <laughs> Absolutely. I was, uh, you mentioned that, I, I shared that that same concept when I was talking to uh, the men in the Bible study on this past Thursday. And I told him, I said, many times when African American goes to sell their home, uh, whether it's, you know, whether it's a $150,000 house or a $500,000 house, one of the things that that we've been conditioned to do is, is to take the pictures off the wall. So that if somebody comes and look at it, they're not uh, uh, automatically turned off because an African American owned it. But that goes back to, because a lot of people don't believe that there is systemic racism. And to me, systemic means that it's pervasive throughout society. And again, I go back around. And so, so if, if, if you look at the, the, the situation with the real estate and the houses, uh, for, that to, for that to happen means that there is a systematic way of thinking that causes my white brothers to think that it's gonna go down in value, even though that person keeps up their house just as well as the next guy. And so we, we have to, I, I think that's, asking those kind of questions those point, and pointing those things out, particularly in the church. Because again, I'm like the Apostle Paul in the fifth chapter of 1 Corinthians. He says, uh, really, God's going to judge the world, but he says, it is indeed your responsibility, church at Corinth, to judge those in the church who are sinning. Mm-hmm. And so the sin of racism in the church, uh, I think has not been adequately or strongly enough dealt with. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, uh, you know, I shared with a couple of preachers last week and they were saying that a lot of times that doesn't happen because the conversation is difficult. Uh, But difficult and right uh, sometimes go hand in hand. And so uh, in a lot of our churches, some some may feel like they're they're subject to being fired if they do so. I I was reading, I'm going to read this little article to you. This guy, uh, former Clemson University football player. Uh, His name is Dante Stewart. He was a writer and preacher in Augusta, George, he said, Stewart said, who was raised in black churches, said he became immersed in white evangelical, evangelicalism while playing football at Clemson University. And after school, he and his wife worshiped at predominantly white churches. He said, Stewart said he was welcomed warmly until he started preaching about race. One church, which he declined to name, rescinded its offer to hire him as a pastor. Listen to what they said. They said, Stu, you are making too much about race right now. He recalls one church leader saying, at the time, Stu was writing articles in prominent evangelical magazines and being asked to speak on panels, but his church didn't want to hear about it. 
It was a painful and exacerbating experience, Stewart says. He said it was exhausting to stay in a white evangelical space. They may have been uh, around me, but they didn't love me and wouldn't fight for me, he said. That's when I knew I had to leave and return to the predominantly black church. So uh, I, when you think about that, if you're not willing to talk about what needs to be talked about, how do we get better at that? Yeah, well, I can tell you because if you remember in history, there's a term called the lost cause. And the lost cause was a, a fictitious story that the daughters of the Confederacy painted up of what it was like in the South before emancipation. And they made it sound like, man, we, were, we rescued all those slaves from Africa and made their life better and it was great, and we, they, we treated them well, and that was the kind of story that was played out. Even though we knew of slaves that had scars on their back, that I don't think that was being treated very well. Right. But sometimes when you have a picture of your past, of your heritage, if it's a decent picture, you don't want to change it. You don't want to open it up. You like what it's, you like the way that sounds. I mean, we all love a good image. And if it, if it makes it look like we're gracious, you say, I, I don't tell me anything else. But, but the truth will set you free Amen. is what the Bible says. Amen. And those things that are in secret need to be in the light. Amen. And, the church, God gave the ruling arm of the world to the church. And unfortunately, the church is always ruling, whether rightly or wrongly. Hmm. And the church has for decades, centuries, have shown that racism is alive and well and have not torn it down. Hmm. And society has followed. And God never says he'll heal the land if everybody goes down in Shreveport and protests. No. <laughs> if that, that won't cut it. God did not say that if we get certain nonprofit organizations to, to promote Black Lives Matter, that we'll be in better shape. <laughs> It'll fix the problem. Right. It's always been if my people will get it right, mm -hmm. I'll heal their land. Amen. And we've got to have the church where we decide to get it right, regardless of what the consequences are, regardless of what people leave the church, regardless of what it does to us financially. Our black brothers are our brothers in Christ. And they should be treated as equal, respected co-laborers, joint heirs with Christ. And the beautiful thing about our Bible study is it's just, it's like that. There is not one person that I can't see any, I can't see anything different between black and white. Mm -hmm. They serve the same God. They study the same Bible. They see the same truth and they respond to it the same way. We should have been together all along. And it just burns me up that every time I say something, even yesterday or Friday when we were in the study, one of my black brothers says, we have a song in the church about that. <laughs> he says that to me every week. And I said, we don't have any songs like that in the church. He said, that's because we're not together. <laughs> we need to be together. Yes. And uh, though you have a nice facility here, um, it, it, it doesn't need to be characterized by the color of those that attend. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. We got, how, do we, how do we step across that door? Yeah. How do we get there from here? Right. That's the question we want to ask. See, you were asking <laughs> questions, but now I get to ask them back. How do we get there from here? <laughs> yes, sir. I, you know, Jeff, I, I believe uh, that it starts with the relationship building process, okay? Right. Because if I never build a relationship with you, 
it, it, I mean, deep abiding gospel relationship, as my friend uh, Dr. Scott Patton said, deep abiding yeah. gospel relationships where as believers in Christ, th- uh, our, our commitment to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ trumps every other every thing. Other. And so when we start doing that, then now we start uh, seeing each other uh, from the prism of God's word rather than the cultural lenses that a lot of us grew up seeing oh, yeah. each other through. And, and, and that's so critically important because I believe once we get to that point to where uh, we allow that word to, to permeate in our hearts to the point to where uh, it doesn't matter what people say, doesn't matter how many friends walk away from you, right. you're saying, this is what I believe in God is leading me to do, and I'm going to say what I see if it's wrong, it, particularly as it relates to the sin of racism. Well, and today it's even more important because on the national scene in our government, um, I don't think racism has been more prevalent than it is today. Yes. Not only are the riots that we're seeing, but even the rhetoric we hear. Mm-hmm. It's t- when you hear terms like um, we need to take things back. Well, who is we in that deal? <laughs> right. And, and when we hear terms like let's make America great again. Okay, that means it was great at one time. Tell me, Doyle, when that was for the African American. Mm. When was it great again for him? Right. What about the American Indian, the, the Native American? When was it great for him? Right. So when we're really saying, let's make a great again, it has to be for a unique group that it actually was great when they were, were oppressing others and had the easy street. Wow. That, yeah. What what else can that mean? Absolutely. And so I, I struggle. That's why the church has to attack racism. We can't gently rub shoulders with it. We have to stomp it out because on the national scene, it's it's getting stirred up. Sure. This this rioting that's going on, men in my discipleship group. Um, Ron and Willie specifically, being African-Americans, took me to breakfast one morning and we were talking about what was going on and they said, Jeff, I'm just telling you, we're sitting on a counter peg that, that things are happening, something's going to blow up at some point. And sure enough, look what we have. Mm-hmm. They were like prophets right. saying that. Right. And we, we, the church has to go beyond. So when those guys were upset that he was speaking on race, oh man, keep speaking it. We got to heal this thing. Sure. Or we're not going to get society healed. Right. Mm-hmm. And so it needs to be addressed on, on every, every street corner. Absolutely. There needs to be ministers, white and black ministers, holding hands in the midst of protest. Mm-hmm. Amen. And until we see that, we ain't not going to get any healing. Amen. Yes. He never promised us a healing through a dialogue. He never promised. It's when my people humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways. And we got to do that. Amen. Amen. You're absolutely right. Uh, And again, it starts, the church has to show society how to do it. And until we as Christians are willing to say, you know what, for God I live, for God I die, if it means losing a friend, if it means that you walk away from me because of my speaking and standing for truth, then so be it. I've said it before and I'll say it again. When we compare the early church to the church in America today, you know, it's, it's a sobering comparison because those guys and ladies stood for truth to the point to where their lives were ser- seriously and were, were in danger. That's Many right. were, uh, you know, boiled in hot oil, crucified upside down. Uh, all kinds of uh, excruciating deaths were brought upon them, but yet and still they were willing to stand on the truth of God's word. Amen. And that's what we have to, I think we got to get back to, I think through all this pandemic that God is, 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 is what one person, I think Dr. Tony Evans said, there's a reset going on. And I think God is given a time for the church to reset, to, to ponder and to think about what we should be doing. What's the primary goal for the church? 
to reach the lost with the transformative power of the gospel. And then once we reach them, we got to disciple, disciple them. He told right. us to go and make disciples, not church members. That's right. Amen. And it's easy to be a member of a church. You can be saved and a member of a church, but not be a disciple. Yeah. Disciplined ones follow the teachings and the edits of Christ, uh, and they don't allow outside influences or the culture to keep them from doing so. A good soldier does not get entangled in civilian things. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And the church needs to be full of good soldiers. Mm -hmm. And usually when God brings crisis, it's for a healing. Well, he has brought in, we are now in a crisis with COVID-19. And how ironic that racism is at the forefront of on the national agenda as this crisis is. That's because this crisis is to make to stir us to repenting of the very thing that we had messed up on. Yeah, absolutely. And we messed up. I mean, look, um, we have we have recently in the last twenty years had presidents fornicate in the White House, but they didn't do it until there were ministers fornicating. Wow. In the church. The church has been and will be the leader of society. When, G, when God looked down at Adam and Eve, he says, you have dominion. He gave that to the church. He says, the keys of the kingdom belong to the church. They are the leaders of society. Either good ones or bad ones. Mm -hmm. And I would hope that in my short life, Separate but equal goes away. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Jeff, let me, let me ask you this. I, this is my opinion, so I want to get your, your take on it. There seems to me as it, there seems to me as if the church in a lot of spaces and a lot of pulpits have backed or have, have allowed the political process to take a preeminent place that it was never designed to have. Uh, that's in the black church and the white church. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I know I'm stereotypically painting this picture here, right. but uh, yeah, but, you are. but particularly uh, more more black churches tend to be more democratic led and in, in trusting the Democratic Party to change things, to give a program or whatever. Uh, white evangelicals are more Republican uh, biased, and and they're trusting in uh, what the political party is going to do, and that used to not be the case. Am I imagining that? <laughs> um. I think a perfect example is right now we're reversing phase two in the pandemic. And the reason why we're doing it is because partisan politics has permeated even in health care so that if a Republican says to wear your mask, the Democrats aren't going to wear them. Mm -hmm. And if Democrats say wear your mask, the Republicans aren't going to wear them. Oh, that's, that's not true. We have decided to find out what's truth and error based in public opinion instead of what God's Word says. God's Word says we should wear a mask just so that I can protect you because I'm supposed to love you as my neighbor. Mm -hmm. So a mask should not be something we even discuss. But partisan has come into even health care. And in the church, it's, it's rampant. Um, see, when I have my children and grandchildren telling me, Poppy, I can't be a Republican or a Democrat. And I go, why not? And they say, it divides God's heart. And I say, well, what do you mean? They say, well, God always judged nations on how they treated the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. That he would, he would destroy whole nations based on the, the way they handled those people that didn't have a voice. Mm-hmm. And he says, if I'm for the sojourner that doesn't have a homeland like the refugees, then I'm going to be Democrat. But if I'm for the unborn, the fatherless, those that are being killed by abortion, I'm going to be Republican. I can't be either one because I divide God's heart because God loves both of those groups. Mm -hmm. And so the church needs to get out of politics mm -hmm. and into the gospel. The gospel can heal our land. Mm -hmm. 
I hate to tell you, I don't, I've been here long enough, and I go to Washington on a regular basis to, to lobby for certain health care issues. The Democrats or the Republicans can't fix us. Right. Only God can fix us. And only God will fix us if his people who are called by his name do what they're supposed to do. And so it's politics has to get out of it. In fact, that's what I said earlier. Paul looked at Timothy and said, Timothy, be a good soldier. And a good soldier does not get entangled in civilian things. And to me, the things you and I are talking about are civilian things. Correct. I need to do two things very well. Number one, love my God with all my heart and all my soul and to love my neighbor as myself. And the two ways that those ways work out are two additional things. I need to be seeking to save that which is lost. Mm -hmm. Or those that have been saved, I need to encourage them all the more to grow and become disciples. That's pretty simple, but that's all there is. (laughs) At least in our book, that's all there is. (laughs) Four simple things. Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you're lost, we want to present the best gift that was ever presented to mankind. And if you're saved, we want to encourage you to grow to love and good deeds. Right. It, is there any more to it than that? <laughs> right, absolutely. So, so Jeff, do you, uh, uh, I, I was talking to one brother and he shared with me that, that at one point in time, although he was not racist, uh, he sort of, turned a blind eye to it or did not necessarily speak out when he saw it. Um, uh, and, and maybe that's because of just, you know, now he is. Now he is doing that. But at one point in time, he, he was not speaking out. I want to ask you the question. Have you lost f- friendships and relationships because oh you've been vo- vocal oh about... Oh, man. I mean, in fact, I've told a few of my friends they need to stay my friends because I don't... I'm not, I'm not going to have as many. <laughs> but, but I think that we need to also have wisdom. Sure. I think, and I've shared this with my bro- the brothers that I work with, that being white in your presence, I need to acknowledge that what happened to Mr. Floyd was nothing less than a modern lynching. Mm-hmm. It was injustice at its highest place. There was no, there was no judge or jury or trial by our land that was supposed to protect. Mm -hmm. It was a lynching. That's what I should say. Mm -hmm. Because by doing that, I'm hoping that you see that I have some understanding of what took place. Now, for you, on the other hand, talking to me, you need to say two wrongs don't make a right. Mm -hmm. And rioting is not going to fix our problem. And though the pain is great, and it's been for 200 to 300 years going on, Writing has never been right. Right. Because when you say that, you immediately identify with me. And so I think we need to learn how to gain understanding with one another so that we have a platform to talk on. One of my black brothers was ex-military. And he calls himself a very much a staunch conservative. Mm -hmm. But to some degree, he does that to build a bridge to his white brothers. When they hear that he was military and that he says, I'm a conservative, immediately they become comfortable with him. They don't judge the book by the cover at that point. Mm -hmm. And then he has a platform to talk about the real issues. And I think that we need to do a better job of learning how to talk to one another so that we can really hear. Because the problem is, is we all have facts, but we gather whatever facts fit us at the time. Mm-hmm. And we're not, we're not listening to one another. We got to find a way to get it where we can listen to one another. Sure, sure, absolutely. That's good stuff, man. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, and I hope to see other groups like, like you have going, uh, brothers coming together, studying God's word, uh, you know, you know, building that bond, that relationship where you can talk about whatever you need to talk about and not be offended uh, because a friend told you something or, or they spoke truth in your life. A friend loved it at all times, Scripture says. Scripture also says faithful 
or the wounds of a friend, oh, that's right. but the kisses of an enemy are, are deceitful. So a, free, a true friend will tell you when you're wrong mm -hmm. and y'all and you, don't fall out and he goes his separate way and you go your separate way. And that's what I think we got to have those deep abiding gospel relationships Boy, to amen. help the church stand up and no longer just be quiet and don't say anything about it. Because in, you know, in, in the predominant African-American church, again, we, we, we preach on the sin of racism. But that, if that voice is not being heard from my evangelical brothers, I don't think we're going to see the change no. and the challenge for transformation that's necessary. And it has to come from that white evangelical pastor. It, it really does because the black church has had the blunt of racism. So, so in their case, it's, under, quote, understandable that they're crying out. Mm -hmm. um, and where it needs to be the elder brother that's willing to do whatever it takes to build up his, his brother. And that's what it's going to have to be. It's got to come. Um, it's not meeting equally. There's a step or two that some of us have to take more than our black brothers have to take. Sure. And, sure. and it's going to be hard for us to do that, but we've got to do it. Yeah. The gospel... He said he gave us the ministry of reconciliation in 2 Corinthians 5. He said, it is your ministry. It's ours. Well, if we have a reconciliation that doesn't reconcile, mm. what, what is that? Right. And Paul said, the gospel that you have makes it where there's no longer Jew and Gentile. Well, let me tell you, the difference between Jew and Gentile was a lot more than color. And that's the only thing that separates us is color. <laughs> right. I mean, by now, the, the true history needs to be out. Some, within just a few years of Reconstruction, we had people, black men, graduating from Harvard at the top of the class. The only difference is our color. That's the only difference. Right, right. And um, we, we got to get there. <laughs> and um, now, on the same token, Doyle, what we've done in the past has not been effective. Correct. And what you said is relationships are the key, and I totally agree with you. Right. So, I invite you to our next discipleship meeting. <laughs> okay. We don't have any pastors in that group. <laughs> and I charge you that on a Friday afternoon... You don't have anything that can go on at 2 o'clock on Friday afternoon. We make it at the most inopportune time to make sure who, who comes wants to come. <laughs> right. And we will. Ask, it's real simple. We ask, we first want to get to know you real well, so we ask you two questions. Give me your high and low for the last week. Mm -hmm. High usually shows us what God is doing magnificently all through creation, mm -hmm. especially right here in Shreveport, Bossier. The low we're sharing vulnerabilities because until we get open with one another where we can share what's going on in our lives, we're not going to help one another. Right. So right. we do those two things. Awesome. And then after we do that, we break open God's word and it's a, it's, it's, <laughs> let's teach one another. Amen. Amen. And I'm afraid that you could help us, but I'm also <laughs> afraid we can help you. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Man, uh, such a rich conversation, man. And I, I appreciate you being willing to come and share with us. I mean, uh, I, again, the times that I've, we've communicated over the phone have been a blessing to me. And I, I knew from the first time I talked to you, I had to have you come and share with us because uh, what you are doing, uh, particularly with your men's Bible study group, uh, it's a unique thing, but it, I mean, others are doing it, but I, I, uh, the passion and the drive and what you're doing it with uh, really impressed me. So keep that up because I think that's one of the catalysts for building those relationships so that uh, when when I know you and something affects you, it's going to affect me. Oh, amen. amen. If something affects my wife, it's going to affect me too because we are closely intertwined. We're in right. covenant relationship. Well, um, I was very fortunate to have men invest in me early on. They helped me learn to share my faith. They helped me learn to pray. They helped me learn to encourage and helped me learn to study. All of those things, they were act, 
actually like many fathers to me. Mm -hmm. And that's what discipleship is, is being a mini father to somebody else. And when you go home tonight and turn on the news, when you watch what's going on in society, don't you realize that fatherhood would heal a lot of our ills? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And if we can father one another to the glory of God, it'll be a good day. Amen. We need more fathers. Amen. Absolutely. Well, Jeff, man, thank you so much, brother, for coming and sharing with us. Uh, I think that, you know, one of the takeaways is, is that we got to get better at building those relationships. And we got to, uh, when we build those relationships, we got to get better at, at keeping them by sharpening each other. Amen. Iron sharpers iron. Amen. And so does a man, the countenance of his friend. So. Well, and also, it says that cons consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And when endurance has its full effect, you're complete, adequately equipped for every good work. Well, I, not being a slave in America, not being oppressed, I didn't experience some of the trials and tribulations that you have but that means that you're better prepared mm. to help me. Yes, sir. Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So well, thank you for letting me come, and I'm, <laughs> I'm looking forward to being trained by you. <laughs> well, bless you, man. Thank you so much. Listen, our time is up, but let's, thank you guys for uh, joining in with us uh, this week. And, Jeff, I thank you, man, for coming and sharing a, a timely, godly word. Keep on standing tall, man. Uh, and uh, let God continue to use you. And, and, and folks, we'll see you guys on next week as we uh, come back and have another heartfelt discussion on real talk, racism in the church. God bless you. See you next week.